Yeah, uh, I'm Frank Petzold. I'm um, a VFX supervisor. Um, for the last few years, um, mainly on production side, that means I'm sort of um, planning the show and there from the beginning uh, until it hits the theaters. Um, you know, working with the director, planning everything. Um, I used to work uh, in a studio as well. I, I'm an uh, ex Tippett studio uh, supervisor, but uh, I think in 2006 or seven, I sort of went freelance. Um, where to start? Um, <laughs> yeah, I want to talk about All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, but before I launch into the actual work and how we did it and how we planned it, um, I sort of wanted to talk a little bit about my where I come from, because I always think that might be interesting to people, um, especially when you're sort of starting up uh, in the business right now and you always wonder, how did those people get there? <laughs> Um, so, uh, with my first slide, I just want to talk a little bit about myself. Um, there's some funny pictures in there too. Um, I started um, visual effects in the film days before the first the digital digital revolution started. Um, so I was a camera assistant in a small studio in Germany, um, then became a cameraman, and um, one thing that very quickly happened is I noticed that uh, even though I have a background in photography and of course it's sort of, you know, when you shoot on film, it's pretty much the same. Um, I discovered um, stop motion very early on. Um, the studio that I was working on, uh, at the little, um, in Germany, we talk, call it the trick camera, the trick camera and in the States, we call it the rostrum cameras or animation stand. Um, that you can see on the lower left on your screen. Um, that's actually the one that I was working on for years. <laughs> um, and it really sort of launched me into the whole idea of visual effects uh, and doing stuff frame by frame. Um, and it's a very um, creative process because this thing couldn't do much. I mean, it literally is now you have it on your iPhone, you take pictures and it turns into a quick time. Um, with this thing, you could move the camera up and down. Of course, it was a single exposure camera. Um, but you also had uh, an XY table and the, the, the and, uh, sorry, yeah, XY table and the Z was the, going, the camera going up and down. Um, you could top light it um, if you were doing animation cells, but you can also bottom light it if you do lithographies. And there was even a way um, with the front surface mirror to project another piece of film uh, in the background. So you could do, actually do animation on top of uh, an existing footage, basically what you would call the, your plate nowadays. Um, so this was basically, I'm, I'm always joking to people that, that sort of grew up in, 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 in the digital realm, is that this was sort of my animation software. That was basically the equivalent to Maya or, you know, what is it, Cinema 4D, 3D Max, uh, Soft Image. Um, uh, and um, the, the only thing is you, you could never see right away what you did. So you had to work really, really careful. Um, but it's something, and that's the reason why I'm sort of talking about that a little bit is, it's sort of a lot of those, that the philosophy of working like that, I sort of took with me to All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, I worked in other action movies um, with lots of creature animation. Of course, there you have to heavily rely on, on animation and rendering and everything. Um, but I wanted to do this show in a compositing way. Um, of course, we had animations, um, the planes and the tanks, and then there's a whole bunch of, of you know, of course, the simulations like, like uh, Houdini stuff of smoke and uh, explosions. But I want, sort of wanted to, you know, front loaded with actual elements like I'm used to. <laughs> um, the machine on the right, uh, the bottom right, that's the optical printer, what you know I called you know my nuke back then. <laughs> um, I had one where you could you know you could have two layers of film uh, including a mask and then you would do your pass and you 
you know, you have to be careful with the generation because you, you scratch, it, scratch your film and all that. Um, then in about, I think it was 1995, um, I moved to the States to work at Tippett Studio. And that was a really interesting time because <clears throat> the studio itself uh, and the few people that did work there back then, including Phil Tippett, they, they themselves made the transition from stop motion work, optical printing to um, the CG uh, and, and, and animation world, which was really interesting because at that time you didn't really have all those roles that you have nowadays where it's very clear what an animator does or what a TD does. Um, we sort of had to figure it out ourselves and, and you, we couldn't even find animators that knew 3D. So we used basically the old the good stop mo guys, Tom Sanamon or you know, all those guys. And, and instead of teaching them the software, um, Craig Hayes built this DID device um, um, that was first done for Jurassic Park, where we basically used the armatures and put little encoders on it and had um, an electronic box built and some software to import the joints or the movement of the joints directly into Softimage. Um, that was Softimage 3 or something back then. <laughs> um, it was a really cool process because you not only learn the, the, the digital world, but at the same time, you always had the, the old fashioned way of doing stuff in the back of your head. Um, yeah, so that's basically how that came about. 2007, like I said, I, I left the studio um, to then uh, become a freelance supervisor and help production. Great. Um, let's see. Gonna. All quiet on the Western Front. Um, I think it all started, I, I started in, I got a call from the director Edward Berger, it must have been September 2020, so it's, it's been a while. <laughs> um, I worked with Edward before on a show called The Terror, um, which was produced by Ridley Scott. And um, we sort of worked really well together and Edward also not coming from like a lot of CG heavy pictures. Um, he sort of needed somebody to to walk him through the stuff and also help him a little bit find the shots. And again, that's sort of where, you know, being an older or, or, or having done camera work before, it sort of really helped setting up the shot, the shot and at the same time also um, helped uh, the director understand how framing of a shot can really um, make your CG better or worse. Um, or the producer, you know, if he wants to know whether it's more expensive or less expensive. A good example is like the good old static shot, the lock off. Um, of course, all your CG work or your comping work is much easier when the camera's not moving or not moving very complicated. Um, yeah, so I got this call from Edward. He says he basically said, "Do you want to get the band back together?" Um, and I said, "Yeah, sure." I dropped everything, um, but he wouldn't tell me <laughs> what the script was um, that I found out the next day. Um, so I, I agreed to work with him without knowing what it was, um, and then he sent me the script, um, and uh, it, it was a little bit of a shock because being German and knowing that this is a very literary iconic book and it's very very important um, that this book and the material doesn't get lost um, especially with the current events um, but it's also it we had just a lot of respect for the material um, because this is one of those anti-war movies that you want to get right um, and we knew right away that we could be flashy um, and you know outrageous with our VFX shots, which is really hard for a VFX artist um, because especially when somebody comes around the corner and says, you know, I, I have a war movie, everybody licks their fingers and thinks about, you know, impossible camera angles, uh, bigger and bigger, bigger explosions um, and all those uh, really massive events with this one. Um, it was about telling the story right 
um, and also putting the VFX, not technically, but story-wise in the background so that we really, you could really uh, uh, see and listen, listening to the actor, to this, the acting. Um, and you, you didn't want to get distracted by some, you know, massive shots in the background. <clears throat> so uh, I right away met with Edward and we went through the script um, because of course, you know, the producer also wants to know how much does it cost <laughs> and how can we do this? Because, um, you know, with war movies, you want to have thousands of soldiers, um, you want to have a lot of gear in it. Um, and uh, at the same time, we also knew that we wanted to have everything absolutely photo real um, and historically real as well. So every plane that you see, every tank, it's really carefully researched um, because the idea was that this movie can hold up you know, for hundreds of years and maybe even be educational um, in schools, well, for the, for the older semesters, I would say. Um, and, and really sort of, you know, do, do its job telling that's war, what, that's really what war is. It's not like those ads that you get from the army, come and join us and become an IT person. Um, it's not like that. And, and you see that every morning in the newspaper nowadays. Um, so we met, um, the script was about 150 pages long. Um, and the usual rule of a minute a page sort of applied in the end. Um, the movie is two and a half hours long, I believe. Um, yeah, we went through the script and it was great because right away we had meetings with our department um, and also the DOP um, to figure out angles. At the same time, me and our department were trying to figure out how to share the work. Um, how far can he build? When do I add my stuff to it? Um, that's something that really is, is very important in pre-production. And I usually want to be there because the, the one thing I hate or don't particularly like is if you get presented with work and go, why did they do it like this? It would have been so much easier. <laughs> um, which plays into the fact that, that I also like to be on set um, every day, even if there's no VFX shots, um, there's always something. Um, to do. Um, it's great to just listening in on Michael's presentation about storyboards. Of course, we also did tons of storyboards, um, mainly for the battle sequences. There's three distinct battle sequences in the movie. Um, of course, we didn't board any like, like you know, dialogue scenes or anything, but um, so these boards that you see here, I mean, I don't even know how many hundreds we did in the end, but um, this is a careful collaboration between the DOP director, myself, um, where we, it took us about six or seven weeks um, to get the boards done. And if you look at the movie, um, yeah, even those shots that are selected here, they're pretty much one-to-one -one with the final product. Um, which was great because that way you can work so much quicker on set. And also the, because we had the DOP involved, um, the, 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 the angles are pretty much, um, and, and the camera lenses are chosen uh, pretty much exactly to what we did in the, in the end on set. Um, so not only did we ask the storyboarder to draw the story and the angles and then and the reverses and all that but we also sort of try to emulate the lenses that we used um, mainly we used a lot of wide angle lenses and then got really close to the actor which sort of gives you a feeling in the in the theater that you are with the soldiers um, rather than doing stuff telephoto or um, you know, putting stuff in the foreground. We were just right in there, which wasn't easy for the, the main actor because we were shooting with an Arri 65. Um, that's a big old camera. And if that thing is in your face, it's threatening, <laughs> especially on the big crane. Um, so, and then of course, uh, also like Michael did said before, we did a little automatic, I call them, or animatic 
Um, we didn't do any previses because the, the shots were pretty clear on how we got to do them um, and didn't really require much technical uh, uh, specialties like, like motion control or anything. Um, but the cool thing was in, in designing those right away with the boards, uh, designing the shots is that right away I knew that I didn't necessarily need like full CG stuff, um, like, you know, fully uh, generated uh, shots. It was really sort of going back to the roots and going, you know what, we can do this in multiple elements. Um, and that's another important thing to be in very early in the project is that you can talk to the producers and say, you know what, it's, it's, we have to be photo real. I don't want to do any rocket science experiments um, with what can be done only in the machine. Um, so it's easier, it looks better. At the same time, you need a lot more time on set, which sometimes on uh, the bigger features is not possible. Um, but since we're in there quite early, I was able to talk to the, the producer and also the AD when he was doing the scheduling. And we sort of found a way um, that we could do the master shots or the master plate. Um, I had a little VFX camera team with uh, my own four cameras. Um, and I was able to, we were shooting with principal, you know, with the principal first unit, we're shooting the foreground, the actor, and then I would go back and do the layering. Let's see, you know, for example, when the tank goes over the actor, that's actually an element that I shot separately in a different location. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a bit more work on the day, but it's very rewarding in the end because you do slap comps very quickly and you got your shot. Um, so what that meant is that we basically in the pipeline for the post-production, we sort of carved out time. We did sort of like a, a, a very quick compositing pass. Um, and then once we liked everything, then went back into the pipeline and started match moving and rotoscoping and the usual stuff. But the slab comps were really helpful, just 50-50 you know, overlays um, to really find the timing and the editing. Um, so that was the first step. Then of course, um, the boring part of my job <laughs> is making all those long lists of you know, VFX shots where everybody does them differently. Of course, on the right side, which is now empty, so you would have uh, the costs and the budgeting and all that. Um, but it's really, it's, it's careful lists that not only show what has to be done, but I also keep a column for myself, how I wanna do this, uh, what assets are required, and also notes for myself and also for the AD, what is needed on the set in order to do that. Um, and it helps everybody. I mean, it helps with the budgeting. You can be a bit more precise um, with whatever vendor you're working with. Um, so you pretty much know exactly what's gonna, um, what, what the work is, the workload, and they can you know, schedule it better and all that. So um, like I said, everybody does it differently. Um, I usually put the boards next to it as well. Um, if I don't have any, it's just some mood. Um, just to get an idea. And um, I used to print these like really huge on like A2 paper. <laughs> um, and you have like a pack of, of like 50 pages um, that I would carry around with me on set. And, and you, right away you do little notes um, while you're shooting it. This doesn't, didn't work or this came out longer than we thought. Um, which by the way, the first sequence um, the first battle sequence is a three and a half minute long shot that consisted of only three takes. So it wasn't just budgeting for, or timing, uh, the scheduling uh, for one, you know, generic shot. It was actually, the shot was 45 seconds long. So it's a whole another beast, uh, particularly for rotoscoping, especially when you have a thousand running soldiers, no, not a thousand, but 250 running motion blurred soldiers. Um, it's something that I hope AI will figure out at some point, but <laughs> it took us a while. Um, great. Then uh, the next 
logical step that we did, of course, you have together with our department, you start doing moods um, or key art. Um, some of them are a bit, bit more crude, some of them are a bit more detailed, um, just to sort of get a feeling of what is really needed. I mean, start and, and, and you start worrying about things that you might have not even previously worried about. Um, for example, weather was a big thing. Uh, and not just whether we're thinking about whether you can shoot on the day or not, but as you may know, uh, war movies never take place on a beautiful sunny day. So you always wanted to have this overcast look. Um, so we had to really think about that and just not just scouting the locations and the battlefields, but also really technically thinking about, especially with SFX, where can we get the smoke tubes? hidden in the ground. Um, luckily, we were able to find uh, an old Russian, an old abandoned Russian airport uh, in, in Czechoslovakia, an hour out of Prague, uh, where we were able to use the, the field in between two runways. And that was completely dug up, um, which you see at the bottom right there. Um, yeah. This is a little quick time. I don't know how well this plays. It's a little choppy. Um, that's uh, the aftermath <laughs> after we were done shooting. Um, you can see the runway to the left and to the right. Uh, and then I think it was about maybe eight soccer fields sort of next to each other. Um, that was about the size. You can see right in the top, you see the French trench. Um, so we, we basically built a little bit of the of the place where it was where we could do everything, um, even though of course those trenches weren't that close to each other. Although I have to say that, especially in World War One, um, nothing much happened in terms of frontline movement. You know, they just kept you know pouring people in, but you know the front line pretty much stayed the same. Um, you can see right away, of course. Even though we had a big location for the battles, um, and especially with wide-angle lenses, then you know it ends somewhere. <laughs> so you either had base camp in there, the runway, a little city, um, and the biggest problem was actually trees. Um, Edward never wanted to see a horizon in the film in the during the battles. Um, he wanted it. Uh, infinite and open at the same time so uh, messed up with smoke and and that it feels claustrophobic again um it's sort of a feeling that you um i don't know if, if you, for, for those of you who are divers you probably know that feeling when you're in the open sea and you're diving and everything around you is blue you don't have any point of reference and all of a sudden you feel very claustrophobic it's 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 a very odd feeling um yeah, so that was the location that we had. Um, then, of course, um, it goes a little bit more into references. Um, on the upper left, you see um, a location scout for that was right away turned into a mood board. Um, so we pretty much nailed that. Um, and again, it was another shot that we designed in a way where I didn't need to do crowd simulations in the computer. I was actually able to do crowd duplications with camera elements, uh, shooting soldiers, uh, multiple passes, um, which again takes a lot, lot of time on set. Um, but it's so rewarding because you actually get real performances from, from uh, stunt guys. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll get into that later how I did it. Um, then of course, you know, World War One is, is one of those, it's, it's so far back, you know, you find stuff on the internet, but not everything. Um, so sometimes we had to make do with like the few black and white pictures, um, and then also trying to find out what was it's the first technical war. Um, what was actually happening? What did they use? Um, for example, this airplane down there is a French plane. There were very few planes. They were just starting, you know, doing the the, the whole idea of, of a war in the air. Um, and these were mostly just reconnaissance planes. Um, they didn't really have much in terms of like, you know, 
bomb releases. I mean, the pilots would literally just throw a grenade out of the cockpit. Um, so all that we had to research and then, of course, digitally build um, the same thing with the, the train engine. Uh, on, the, on the lower right, you see a picture that's an actual shot of uh, the signing of the armistice, the, the capitulation that the Germans signed. Um, it was two uh, train trucks in the forest, I think Latier is the town, um, that met and it was sort of, it was a safe buffer zone in between. You had to walk from one train to the next. Um, and we wanted to be, like I said, historically correct. So we actually found w one of those type steam engines uh, in a museum and did 3D scans uh, of the steam engine. Um, the plane we had to model by hand because we couldn't find anything. And the same thing for the famous Saint-Germain tank um, on the upper right. Um, these were really interesting tanks because uh, they didn't have big engines. They were massively heavy. Um, and um, they would go, I think, about maybe three, four kilometers per hour. So you, you could walk faster. Um, but it was the idea was really just psychologically because, you know, the soldiers had never seen something like that. Um, and that sort of, you know, right away I had an idea that, because I usually work on shows with creatures in it, uh, and this one didn't have a creature, and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to elect this thing to be the big creature. So in the sequence where the first tank appears, it's very much set up like an introduction, like an establishing shot for a creature uh, with low angles, um, and it's breaking through the fog. Um, first you, you, you sort of make out an outline and then it, you know it becomes a silhouette and we, we be, really wanted to show that the soldiers didn't have a clue what that was it was it made noise everything started to vibrate um but they didn't know what it was i mean they didn't have the word for it you know now you say tank but they were like what is this thing same thing goes for you know the, the horrible flamethrowers um there was a lot of technology all of a sudden that, that came up and was used in war. Um, yeah, the shoot. <laughs> it was grueling, um, but fun, I have to say. Um, we shot in the winter time, uh, in, like I said, outside of Prague. Um, of course, the ground was frozen the next day. It thawed and it was muddy. And we had this um, uh, this machine is called a hexatron. It's basically a techno crane that is mounted on a movable base, which usually, I mean, you can you can drive it up mountains, uh, but we got stuck, <laughs> and this thing is quite heavy. So there was complications in there. So especially when you plan VFX shots, which sometimes have to be, you know, the camera has to be locked, or you know, you have to hit exactly the angle for your second plate. Um, it was quite challenging. Um, yeah, and so I always say that when you watch the movie, um, it pretty much looked the same behind the camera as what you see on the screen. So um, the actors standing in, in you know ankle deep water, muddy water, and it's it's raining. Pretty much, it's like ice rain. Um, we went through the same stuff. Um, I lost 18 kilos on the shoot. Put him right back on. Um, yeah, so some more pictures. Of course, there were drone shots in there um, with the big drones that can actually carry a big aeroflex. Um, and we actually, you know, went as far as, as timing explosions um, together with the drone pilots so that the, we had there's a couple of moments where the drone is actually flying through an explosion cloud that just happened. We did that shot like four or five times until we got it. Um, they had to throw away the motors afterwards, but it, the shot's great. Um, Matthias, could you play this uh, making of shoot video? Is that possible? Of course, uh, gonna start it right now. Let me, uh, give me a sec. So I, I just put a little uh, video together, some, some impressions from the shoot.
Monsieur le maréchal Ervartetzi. Monsieur le maréchal. Stillstand. Ich stehe vor Ihnen in der Hoffnung, dass Sie unsere Anwesenheit zum Anlass nehmen, alle Feindseligkeiten auszusetzen. Great. I couldn't see it myself, but I heard it. So <laughs> I hope you that gave you, gave you a little bit of an impression. Um, is my screen back on, Matthias? Uh, yes, okay, you're great. live again. Great. Um, I was talking about elements and doing stuff a little bit more traditional. Um, of course, that required that um, during the time when VFX wasn't needed for the shot, let's say dialogue or interiors, um, I would go back to the battlefield and um, I had production built uh, a, some green screen out, outdoor green screen stages that we built uh, partially with you know big green screens just you know temporarily ones but um, also uh, sea containers um, that we would stack because you always have a problem with wind um, and then I also got together with SFX and we just shot a lot of explosions as elements and I'm just going to run this it's probably a little choppy on your screen but um, you get the idea um, so I shot a lot of like real explosions, um, also because you sort of, it's, it's almost like when you, when you work on a shot or a, on a design, you sort of want to experiment with different things and, and you don't even know what you're going to get. Um, but you sort of find yourself and, and you discover stuff that you wouldn't have discovered if you would sit down and try to simulate it in Houdini. Um, I, to the day, I still think that if I can get a real explosion, this looks a million times better. Um, and even though sometimes, it, I mean, obviously, sometimes you have keen problems, but I was able to shoot the, the, uh, the explosion elements, for example, in a similar uh, weather conditions. So, you know, rotors, the rotor edges or the keying edges weren't even that crucial. Um, so you can pop stuff right in. Um, the other good thing about it was um, I was able to very quickly in the Avid just do layouts of a whole scene because one thing you don't want to do is, is doing a battle is, you know, you work on a shot and you put everything you got in there. Um, uh, and then, the, you know, it's, it's either too much or all of a sudden there's a hole because there's nothing and then the next shot has a lot. So you wanted to have, um, you know, a little bit of a consistency throughout the sequence how stuff is going off and the timing and everything and we called it the um, the rhythm of war um, and that was a really helpful tool to just have those things ready and you can just slap them in there and go yep that feels about right the sound guys were happy um, because they had something to work with right away 
Um, and it's just more intuitive. Um, it's, it's like, you know, working in Photoshop and just quickly finding stuff online and just throwing it in there um, rather than going through the whole pipeline of, you know, doing simulations, waiting for wireframes, renders, and, and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, the same goes, of course, for the flamethrowers. It's just, they look so authentic, especially with the black smoke. Um, I didn't want to, you know, spend time in experimenting doing this in the machine. Um, um, the same goes for burning people. Of course, that goes with the flamethrowers. Um, we sometimes just use it for reference. Um, because one thing you will notice uh, in VFX is that, of course, if you sit in the dark all day long, you you know you, you can do all the simulations, but you don't really know how it looks like because you've never seen it yourself. Um, so you know, I'm, it's always useful that stuff, um, whether you use the elements or not. But at least you know how the stuff should look like. Um, that's my favorite. Uh, <laughs> running soldiers. Um, Again, I didn't want to animate them, although we did scan soldiers um, just in case, because you never know. Um, but the, the trick that I usually do is I, I set up uh, the three to six cameras in different angles um, on this little outdoor green screen stage, and then <laughs> ask production to buy me a couple of treadmills, which it's always funny to see their faces uh, when they hear that. And you, yeah, you paint them green, and then every time I had uh, uh, stunt actors free up, um, I would call them over and we'd just shoot tons of material of just them running. And every stunt guy came up with their own little way of, you know, charging or shooting while running, which probably nobody would do, but um, it just looks so much more dynamic um, and you don't have to analyze it, um, whether it looks real or not, it's, it's real. Um, the same thing goes at the, the lower right. You see a bunch of rats. <laughs> There's uh, three shots in the movie where rats are fleeing because they're the first to sense the, 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 the approaching tanks. Um, of course, you can animate a, a rat. Um, pretty much every CG shot, shop has a, a rat laying around. Um, but I had a free stage while we were shooting the, uh, the, uh, the, the train car interiors. Um, next door, there was an empty stage, so uh, I just invited a few rats um, <laughs> to to just shoot them. And it was so, so much easier. And again, you get stuff that you didn't even think about. There's one rat doing something crazy. Uh, the other one stops and then freaks out. Um, there's also some scenes where uh, rats are uh, feeding on a corpse. Um, yeah, so I just took a dummy, dressed them in green, and then we put rats on it. I think we lost a couple of rats <laughs> because the door was open in the studio. Um, hugely helpful. If you, if you have the time on set and if you have a willing producer, shoot elements. They're great. Um, same goes uh, for even, you know, sometimes you can't use them really, but use them for reference. There's, there's a few shots where soldiers are getting directly hit um, by a grenade. How does that look like? Um, again, you don't want to be too flashy. At the same time, you sort of want to get your head around um, what actually happens. And the funny thing is, not funny, but the, the, the thing is that this particular take we actually used um, extracted the middle part um, to, uh, because one general is sort of calling uh, to charge and he right away gets blown up. So, um, this what you see there is, is just like Ziploc bags with, with blood. And then um, usually I ask catering for the leftovers um, and you put all kinds of stuff in there. There's rice in there and vegetables and all that. Um, of course the head and of the dummy and all that you can't use, but um, yeah, that's, that's all really helpful stuff. Um, and you just, you might even be able to use the stuff for the next film. Um, of course, we also did the LED thing. Um, there was, of course, the, the train sequence, which we built in the studio. And uh, uh, we had to you know, do some, some outside stuff. The train wasn't actually driving. 
um, but we wanted to be have the out the the, the, uh, the the exterior to be alive. So we we actually shot plates with soldiers patrolling, talking to each other, you know, lighting cigarettes, smoking, laughing. Um, there's like occasional birds flying through the frame and all that. Um, and of course, with the LEDs, you have to be really careful when you plan it. <clears throat> so I usually pre pre plan those in in 3D, so I can try out the lenses um, with the virtual camera and just go go through the train set um, and make sure that <clears throat> we have enough coverage of the LED. Um, on the upper right, that was a quick test. I'm sitting on a chair, and it was, of course, the, the cool thing is with the LEDs is they're sort of they they light the scene, so that's the big advantage uh, compared to a green screen. Um, <clears throat> that um, you get a little bit of lighting at the same time you also, especially in the train set, there was so much um, cutlery and silverware that you wouldn't have all those green reflections in the glasses and, and all that. Um, so we, I, I think we shot like three days in there. Um, models, yeah, um, of course we had to animate a few things. Um, the planes are, really far away and they're sort of the quick action so we didn't really have to get into a lot of detail or displacement maps and, 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 and like little bumps so the plane was was quite simply built um these are low res models by the way um the tank we had to sort of we scanned the one um that we found in, in france um and then we actually built one working mock-up um, we basically built a shell on top of an old, uh, what's it, what's, yeah, uh, a tow, a tow tank <laughs> um, that would pull other tanks out of the mud um, from the 70s, and we literally built a shell on top of it so it could drive a little bit. Of course, it got stuck all the time, but, and it, sometimes it wouldn't start. Um, but all the other tanks that you see in the movie, they're all animated. Um, so. That was, of course, something that we did. The same thing for um, the train. This is, we recycled our train engine that we scanned um, just sort of to bring proxy. Some shots, we, they're, they're walking through uh, an old train station and it didn't feel like war. So we recycled our nice uh, train scan um, and messed it up. Um, and basically sort of had that just peppered it in there with other broken things. So it looks like an attack just happened. Um, the same thing for our beautiful plane, we also messed it up. Um, that's a scene where they are back in camp and have a few days off, literally from war. Um, and they're sitting there in a canteen outside and um, they're, I think they're peeling potatoes and there's a little dialogue and it, it felt a little idyllic or too idyllic for us so we wanted to bring the proximity of war back into that scene so we just had in the shots in the background you see a crashed french plane um, <clears throat> and there's also constantly planes doing little dog fights in the really deep background uh, which was great for sound And um, by the way, we did scan the whole battlefield that you saw earlier, this huge thing. We did a 3D scan of it. Um, again, that was sort of a safety measure because we didn't know how how the, the, the terrain is going to behave while we're shooting. Um, and we thought we might have to actually uh, extend a lot more or completely rebuild the set. Um, textures, um, something that's, I'm always carrying a camera with me. Um, even on days off, um, because you, you, you find stuff, and, and it's particularly for textures that you might use for, for matte paintings, there's things sometimes that you find that you couldn't even thought of, um, like the one on the upper right. Um, it's this old broken down building. It's, it's not shelled, it's just broken down. But just, you know, this pile of, of, of tiles that you see there, of roof tiles, um, you wouldn't think about that. When, when you start in, you know, doing a broken down building. Um, lots of those windows and door frames, they were actually all used in the movie. Um, or this broken down roof at the bottom, you know, you see how the, uh, the struts are sort of breaking through. 
that's really good stuff to have. Uh, same thing with weather. And there's one scene where we had to completely replace um, uh, the snow. It was it wasn't supposed to uh, sh uh, play in the snow, but when we started shooting in the morning, we had those beautiful Christmas flakes, um, which gave a, a really cool mood to the scene. But then come noon, the sun comes out and it looked like a chocolate commercial. Um, so we actually had to uh, digitally change the, the weather and the set to snow. Um, we'll see that later. Um, I'm also carrying a lot, an iPad all the time, especially if when you're shooting, you have those, what is it called, Q-Take, or um, there's this different pieces of software where the, the video uh, assist can send out the live feed onto your iPad um, while you're shooting. Um, and of course, what I do is I just do a, sc a screenshot and right away just start jotting in little notes. Um, because especially when you work with international crews, sometimes it's more helpful to um, to just you know draw pictures rather than trying to formulate it in some way that nobody understands. So I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Um, same thing here. These are sort of the shots that pretty much are you know the same in the movie in the end. It's just sort of while you're waiting for for a camera reset, you just start drawing around. Oh. This is a before and after. I wanted to show Matthias if he could view the second video. It's like three minutes of. Uh, sure, show. on it, <clears throat> on it. Okay.
Great. All right, you're, you're back on. Excellent, thank you. So um, just, I, I guess I have a couple more minutes. Um, just a bit more in detail as a freeze frame. I mean, this is, for example, a, a good shot to really show that, you know, sometimes you just have to get your shot no matter what. Um, you know, it's, even if it's just for reference, I mean, the, the matte painting down there is, is pretty much just using parts of the plate. Uh, and all those elements are in there that um, I shot. Um, so, you know, the running soldiers and the explosions and, and uh, the flamethrowers, the, you know, these are not uh, simulated. Uh, the smoke in this case is, um, so this, this is CG particle smoke. Um, in the, the top frame, you can see, you can see uh, on the upper right, um, first unit is, is doing a full shoot while I'm trying to get my plate. But <laughs> uh, same here, um, you know, the runway, you can see that. Um, uh, we had to basically, we just used the middle part of the, the plate. Um, this was an interesting one. Um, you know, the, you might ask yourself, why didn't you just put a green screen in front of them? Um, the shot was actually thought of to be much bigger, and we actually had, I think, 200 extras in this shot, um, but only this shot made it into the movie. Um, yeah, so it was basically just, you know, showing the, the infinite size of, of the battlefield. Um, it was, uh, of course, a little bit of a roto nightmare. Um, the little trick that I did there, because I couldn't put up green screen, because there's an actual cliff behind it, um, I just had SFX smoke up the background a little bit. So, you know, and some of those soldiers were able to do Luma keys. Um, just little tricks, so, you know, sometimes you just have to improvise on set. Um, this is a really good one. Um, you know, that's sort of the, the shot I was, or some of one of the shots that I was referring to at the beginning, you know, it's, it's, it's a shot that I wanted to do. And I, I wanted to, I was thinking about, you know, can you do this shot on an optical printer? And that was sort of my philosophy in designing the shot. Um, of course, we couldn't drive tanks over the actors. Uh, we couldn't even do it over the actual uh, uh, trench because it would have collapsed right away. So. We sort of built this car pit that was reinforced with concrete um, to have the tank drive over it so that you see slack in the in, in, in the treads and, and the wheels are moving um, so that's why i didn't do it on the street um, and then you just sort of you layer it and you just mess it up with extra particle stuff and everything So this this is the little element. Um, just wanted to show here that sometimes you also have to you know think about like cutting the light. So some of the tricks that we did. I'm too slow, so I'm gonna speed this up. Obviously animation. And this is a, a very typical crowd duplication shot, which takes a lot of time, but it was all worth it. Um, having to animate those guys in CG would have been light. Um, flames, uh, there's always two ways of, of doing flames on an actor. You can either do the stuntman burning and replace the face, or you put flames on the real actor. We chose to use the real actor because his performance was excellent, and he comes really close to the camera, so face replace would have been a nightmare. Um, so they're partially CG flames and, and partially elements. That's the shot I was talking about earlier. And this is a horrific shot, but it was technically very fun to work on actually, um, because it was such a perfect uh, setup. And um, we also, we, we shot it as a lock off, which you have much more freedom in, in designing your shot and then just did some camera shake on top of it later. So uh, that was pretty much it. So all in all, we animated tanks, planes, uh, we changed weather a lot. <laughs> we had birds, rats, um, lots of explosions. Of course, smoke and fog, um, also to, to cover up the tree lines in the background. Of course, wounds, I didn't want to show them. Um, muzzle flashes, which are historically correct. I actually went to a museum and shot muzzle flashes from an old machine gun um, in front of a black screen. Uh, of course, the usual sky replacements, uh, buildings, well, I had to pretty much destruct 
all the buildings to make them look like war. And then, you know, retouches, the you know, wire removals and all that stuff. Um, and I wrote down, oh, CG knives and forks. Yeah, there's one scene that I don't want to show because it's so horrific. It's one soldier is uh, committing suicide by sticking a fork into his neck. Um, of course, we had to do all that in CG because uh, with the actor, you can only do that once. So that was it. Thank you very much. I'm going to switch cameras. Wonderful, yeah, or quote unquote wonderful. <laughs> it's, <laughs> no, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, tough. It's, it's tough. It's a tough picture, but it has to be. It's yes, I, I guess it's I guess it's 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 part of human nature. It uh, the conditio humana. It's it's part of human history. So it's I I also I saw the movie a couple of months back, and it's 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 sad and it's moving, um, but but yeah, it has to be. All right, but um, yes, thanks, thanks a lot for the insights. It's this, this, it's eye opening. Whenever, whenever stuff like this is shown, this is this is super eye opening. So let's let's go really fast into just a couple more questions. Otherwise, obviously, we'll we'll push the audience towards uh, Discord um, for for further questions. So let's dive in. There's a question from Mike, and it says, <clears throat> "Do you believe that your old school old school training pre CG travels with you into every new project slash company, and gives you the advantage of being more versatile and quicker to adapt to new technology as that is all developed on top of um, of that foundation?" So in other words, is the old school training a blessing or a curse? Oh, it's a blessing um, because you, you, you right away think differently. You look through the camera and then you, 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 you think in layers rather than in, you know, how, how can I in the 3D world build this? And, I, you know, of course, I have to do that on other projects like Tarzan, for example. You know, you have tons of animals and worlds that, you know, we couldn't possibly do. Um, and... Uh, but I have to say that, you know, technology is, is of course, ever changing, but the, the basic principles, are, it's still the same. Like I said, it's like you have, you know, animation and, and rendering, um, and then you, you put the stuff together. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, back in the days before the software, was, you know, cause there was comic software, we used a Photoshop batch, you know, that would just record your mouse over and over. Um, and if I work on Nuke, which I, I love doing um, nowadays, it's, it, it's it's pretty much the same. Um, it's just easier. Um, I'm a little afraid of this AI thing because that I think is a little bit of a bump in the road right now. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love a good tool, but um, if the tool takes over, that ain't right. So um, yeah, I can I can always I say that to everybody. Um, if even if you do complicated CG stuff, do photography. It just I like, I, alone the the, the the understanding of of the f stop, you know what does what does it do you know creatively with the image the the lens lenses long lens short lenses, um, that stuff that you can do it in the computer but you have to know why you want it. <laughs> so yeah, I mean an old school stuff. I mean it's it's fun. <clears throat> All right, so then uh, a, just a uh, quick comment from Emmanuel um, saying that was amazing. That's that's cool. I and I agree. Um, and then an, a, another quick question. Let's let's do one more um, quick question, and then the the other ones will will push to to Discord to to uh, to get moving. So how uh, the the question is, how are the landscape gaps filled? Um, yeah, the, the problem in general was that, of course, the, the, the battlefield was rather flat. Um, so, you know, usually you hope for little hills, so you, you know, at least your mat line is above the heads. We didn't have that. Um, so uh, I sort of worked with SFX together and, and we tried to do a lot of stuff with smoke, just obscuring stuff. Um, but of course, when you're on an airport, there's always wind and, and sometimes it doesn't work. Um, so it was it was painful, but we really had to rotoscope. Um, and then also, you don't just want to rotoscope just the the, the 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 picture of the horizon because then it becomes very flat. You want to layer it. If you do smoke, 
you know, it has to start, you know, the first row of soldiers is a little bit of smoke, second row, third row. Um, and we just did um, quick passes where we just did very crude roto just to make sure that it works. And then uh, the shot disappeared for two months <laughs> while they were doing roto and then came back. But if you know that right away you plan for it, that's the first shot you start. Yeah, and I guess that that planning obviously comes comes with experience, right? Uh, as a as an experienced VS, EVFX super, I, I would assume you know pretty much once once you even read the script, you're probably already thinking of okay, I'm gonna tackle this this way or the the other way, um, and we're gonna use special effects or or, or CG. Or, I, I guess that comes with with the territory and with experience, right? <laughs> Well, this, I mean, if, you, if you've done a few shows, it, it, it's, it's, it's when, you, when you come to the scout, uh, finding locations, and everybody goes, great, this looks awesome. And, and sometimes it's like, it's, I go, no, this is, this is horrible. <laughs> they don't understand why, I'm, you know, because I've done it before, and I know exactly what's going to happen, you know, so. Um, but it's, yeah, it's experience. It's, you know. All right. That was super fantastic. Hey, thank you, thank you so much for for this presentation. Um, I'm gonna need to check probably if I or I'm gonna check if we're gonna upload the video to YouTube. I'm I'm gonna have to check not for kids. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> but it it's should okay. be, everybody who's considering joining the army should watch this movie first. Oh, I do agree. I do agree. Um, all right. So. Um, if if you have a little bit more time, please join us on on Discord, and we're yeah. just going to jump over to a quick break, and then.